Hey everyone and welcome to Church Online. I'm so glad you could join us and I have with me one of our fabulous admin team, Alex. Welcome Alex. Thank you Matt, hello. I know that Alex knows pretty much everything about everything. So I've actually prepared a little bit of a pop quiz for Alex. Are you ready for that? Uh, sure, Matt. <laughs> so in what ways can people get connected with us? Good question. Uh, through our socials, so Instagram, Facebook, and also our YouTube channel. And don't forget our website. Wonderful. Well done. One for one. Next question. Where do our kids find all the online church stuff? On the church website, if you click on the online link, uh, and also on the YouTube channel, the Kids Church YouTube channel. Excellent. Another question for you. Someone got a bag of goals in 1990. They kicked five. <laughs> Who was it? It's got to be Matthew Lloyd. No, it was the Essendon Football Club. <laughs> they kicked a total of five goals in 1990. All right. I had you stumped on that one. It was the Essendon Football Club and not one player that kicked a bag of five. My next question, though, is how do teenagers engage with Fuse Youth? So they can get onto the YouTube channel, the church YouTube channel, and scroll down and find the Fuse Youth. And, uh, and also on Friday nights at 7 o'clock, they go live, uh, and following that have a Zoom small group meeting. That sounds awesome. And I think you'll also find them on Instagram and Facebook. Yep. Wonderful. Of all right, I think you're three from four. <laughs> now, my next question is, what does the number 5,731 mean to you? Oh, it's got to be how many losses Collingwood have had. <laughs> nice try. It's actually the number of days since the Bombers have won a final. Oh, gosh. Now, I think it's a great number. And they say a, a week's a long time in football, well, 818 <laughs> weeks since the Bombers have won a final. That, that's a long Long time. Keep them coming, Matt. Keep them coming. <laughs> but our next question is, how are young adults connecting right now? Great question, Matt. Uh, there's a YMY service this Sunday at 5.30, so you can log on to the church YouTube channel and watch it all there. Uh, and they also have uh, small group meetings during the week. Wonderful. That's awesome. I do have another question for you. If I wanted prayer, for instance, if I was like... <laughs> I need people to pray with me that the Bombers will finally win a final because, you know, my children have never seen that. How would I go about that? I'd just like to ask you a question, Matt. When was the last time Collingwood have won a grand final? Uh, it's 10 years. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> They've lost a few in between that too. Shh, shh. We won't talk about that. Uh, if anyone wants prayer, they can contact the church or they can also email prayerministry at bcoc.com.au. Wonderful. Well... If I'm looking for more worship, where would I find that? Uh, on all the places that you listen to music. So uh, iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, uh, you can find our, our playlists on there. Excellent. Right. Well, well, that's great that people can connect with worship in, in many different ways. And as we know, our, our leaders are praying for wisdom and strategy on how we're going to move forward in this ever-changing mm. world where restrictions are, are being lifted um, how can people partner with us right now? Yeah, good question. Um, it's obviously a challenging time. So if you can pray for people who are affected by this current climate, um, pray for the leaders who are making the decisions within the church um, that we move in the right direction. Uh, reach out to anyone you know, people that you have existing relationships with. Just reach out, say hey, buy a coffee, drop one off at the door. Uh, just little things like that to encourage people during this time. Excellent, excellent. Wonderful. Well, that's it from us. We now get to introduce Pastor Bram, our senior pastor, who's got an incredible message on repentance. So get ready for that. Thanks, Bram. Hey, everybody. Welcome at Bedic Church of Christ online experience. And as you can see on the screen, our vision is to be His presence in every place. And that's the purpose we live for. And in our online experiences, we want to empower you through God's Word to make sure that you know what it's about. What's being His presence in every place about? And uh, we would like to do four things in people's lives. We'd like to help them to follow Christ. We'd like to guide them towards loving people. We'd like to empower them to be able to full, fulfill their vocation in their professional arena and change the city that they function in. 
And we would also love to mobilize people to plant more faith communities. And therefore, the first area that we would like to address in your life is really empowering you to be a Christ follower, to know what it's like to follow Christ on a daily basis. Now, it's critical for you to understand that as we journey with you about this concept, there are certain basic foundational truths that we will dust off, but there might be some fresh revelation for you. And therefore, I'd like you to get your Bible and your journal or your notepad, whatever you use, and just ask the Holy Spirit to speak to you as we look into the Word. And this week, I'll be addressing certain aspects. And next week, Pastor Matt Daniels, he will come in and share some principles with us about baptism. And the week after that, Pastor Ken will share with us about the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And there are certain aspects about following Christ that we would like to stir up in our community, especially amongst the people of faith. So this series is focused on helping you to follow Christ more accurately. Now, it's, it's important to understand each human being is built in with a desire to fulfill his or her potential. And much of your life goes in the direction of the question, who am I, what can I achieve, and what makes me unique? And sometimes we refer to that race to the top as the rat race. And the problem with joining the rat race is even the winner still stays a rat. And we've discovered that there's a deeper purpose to live for in this life, and that is to be His presence in every place. And as we look towards Christ for leadership in this area, we see certain principles in his life that we'd like to see as an example for us, but also of us. And therefore, this morning, understanding that you are part of the human race on your way up, there's certain challenges that we all share as humans. In our journey on the way up of success, we sometimes do things that we're not proud of. There might be some unhealthy competition, some inferiority, some things that take hold of us that makes us act in a way that we would not be proud of afterwards. It reminds me of the story uh, that I've heard about Sir Conan Arthur Doyle. And some ascribe this to Mark Twain, but apparently he was a real prankster. But he had some friends in the higher echelons of society and he loved to play pranks on them. And one day he sent five telegrams to some of these friends of them. And all he wrote on this telegram was the following. It says, all is discovered. Flee at once. And apparently, within 24 hours, all five of those people receiving the telegram have packed their bags and fled England. The reality is they all had guilt that stood up from their past and they were challenged about what has been discovered. What is he referring to? And that possible loss of their status and their, their, their pers perspective in society and how the world sees them made them flee the reality they found themselves in. You know, you and I also have some things that we would rather have the world not know. Things in our past. But that weight of guilt sometimes robs us of our potential. Robs us of the ability to follow Christ. Because we will be scared that some things from our past will pull us back, have some kind of a hold on us, and d d disqualify us to follow Christ properly. Now, this is not unique to this generation or modern mankind. It is actually something that has been with us for a very long time. Now, if you talk about guilt, you can see it right through all of the ancient scriptures, how it, how it manipulated people's behavior. And uh, I went into a search on the term guilt and said, let's find out what guilt is, how it is described, how does modern man describe it? And I went to the linguist's biggest nightmare. I went to the Urban Dictionary, and it says the following about guilt. It says, one of the worst feelings in the world. It eats you alive. It can destroy you. 
Sometimes the only way to get over it is forgetting what has happened, but we never forget. And that's the dilemma of mankind. Mankind struggles with a history that is littered with behavior that we're not proud of. And guilt brings shame. And shame brings unworthiness. And unworthiness brings distancing emotionally and manipulates people into behavior that sometimes even fragments the closest relationships they have. And God's heart was to deliver man from guilt. Now, where does this guilt come from? And I want to take you to the scriptures and show you where this guilt comes from. Where, where is the sense of something has been lost, something has been below par in my life, and I struggle to contend with that? Uh, we're going to go back to the book of Genesis. It's one of the ancient scriptures. And in Genesis chapter 1, there's this interesting conversation between what we believe to be a snake and man. And in this conversation, something happens. Satan comes and he challenges something about man. But he does it in a very subtle way. You see, God created man. And here's a bit of the creation story. God said, let us make mankind in our image. So man was the carrier of God's image. Uh, it goes further to say we were created in his likeness. We were created to rule. So there was a glory bestowed upon man that no other creature had. And in this conversation that Satan has with man, he says the following. Now read closely with me what he says. He says, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows when you eat from the tree, you will be like God. But wait a minute. In Genesis 1.26, it says, we are already made in God's likeness. And Satan promises man something that man actually already has. But here's the difference. Satan makes himself and positions himself as the source of glory. The moment that man turned his head away from God and started to follow what Satan said, there was a change in authority and man lost something dearly. And that presents guilt. The sense of something that was lost. Something in the very nature of man. We refer to that sometimes as lostness. And Romans 3 de describes for us what man has lost. It says in Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And that is the challenge for mankind. Mankind is in this feverish journey trying to glorify itself. And then we make mistakes in our greatest efforts. And we are reminded that there's a guilt that we would have to pay. And we go on a guilt trip. And the bigger the guilt trip, the harder we try to improve ourselves and to work towards saving what was lost in our lives. Regaining the glory. And this snake actually lied to us by telling us we are not the likeness of God. Now, you've got to understand, God's heart for you and for me is to live in fellowship with Him. That's why we are made in His likeness. Not so that we can bestow glory upon ourselves. It is so that he can have something alike that he can relate with. And that's what Satan stole from us. But he's clever, Satan. He tells man, if you try hard enough on several levels, you will be able to glorify yourself again. And I've seen all over society how people have engaged with certain activities trying to glorify their lives again. I've seen legalism. You know, the legalist 
says if I adhere to certain religious laws and I can obey these laws, I'll achieve a sense of glory. There's hedonism that says if I can reach certain levels of enjoyment in life, I'll reach a level of glory that I aspire to. And then there's ritualism. The desire to go through certain religious activities to try and glorify yourself. Now, in a later part in this sermon, we are going to look at why these three can never glorify man. This will never fulfill your desire to have the glory of God restored in your life as you are a Christ follower. So mankind is caught up with a snakes and ladders kind of game where you try to climb the ladder towards glorifying your own life and then make a mistake and then you fall down all the way back and it's up and down and up and down and you really have to contend with this game. And that's the problem with religion is it catches you by inviting you into a game where you try to complete the game but you consistently have these backslides. And legalism will never do that for you. Listen to what scripture teaches us. And this is in Romans 3.20. It says, Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of our sin. And what the law does, it creates in us an awareness of our mistakes. Now, you follow what you're aware of. That's just the law of how people function. I remember trying to teach my son to ride his bicycle, and I made the mistake of telling him, beware of the lampposts. Guess what he ran into with his bike? The lampposts. And if we are sin conscious, we follow sin. Therefore, no law can deliver you from sin, from that sense of loss and that desire to glorify yourself. Hedonism is something that promises much fulfillment, but at the end of the day, you stay as unfulfilled as at the beginning. I remember this, reading the scripture for the first time, not really understanding it in 1 Corinthians. It's 1 Corinthians 6, verse 13, where, where Paul quotes a song sang by heathens in the time of the Bible. And the song went like this. It says, food for the stomach and the stomach for food, and God will destroy them both. Having this mentality of all there is to enjoy is temporary glory, temporary fulfillment, and people throwing themselves at sin because, you know, everything is going to stop existing because God is going to wipe it all. Fatalism sets in. And there's no way that you as a human being can be fulfilled with a fatalistic mindset. The third thing, ritualism, uh, it, it seems so pious and it seems so right. But do you know that religious rituals will always lead you to a dead-end street? Listen to what Hebrews writers say in the book of Hebrews. It says, The gifts and the sacrifices religiously being offered were not able to clear the conscience of the worshiper. They are only a matter of food and drink and various ceremonial washings. And so many people run after religious activities to try and restore that sense of loss that cannot be restored by anyone else but Christ. Now legalism, hedonism and ritualism is presented to us as a possible solution to the sense of guilt and lost glory that we carry as mankind. One of my favorite books in the Bible, for me, actually introduces us to another way. When it introduces Christ to us, it says that there came a man. And this man was at a whole other level than legalism, hedonism, or ritualism. He was an incredible being. He describes it in the following way. It's John 1 verse 14. He says, we have seen something. We have seen His glory. The glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father. Now remember, 
Adam in the garden was God's son. And suddenly the writer of the book of John says, listen, we've seen another son that comes from the father, but this son had a glory on him that made him be presented to us as the one and only. He was at another level. That which man has lost was so well presented in Christ and now Christ goes about and he interacts with individuals and he says the following. He walks up to a man like Matthew, a tax collector, and he says, you follow me. And he invites Matthew into a life that doesn't necessarily define geographical proximity when he talks about following. It's about the typical closeness. To who Christ is. When Christ says to Matthew and the disciples, you follow me, he actually invites them to see themselves in him. You follow after me. You see me as the example of you and you emulate my life and come and follow me. It was not about geographical proximity. It was about becoming a type of the prototype. Christ. And being a Christ follower is recognizing God's glory in Christ and the invitation for you to be restored in the very same likeness. That's what it means to be a Christ follower. And that's what we want to raise you up as, as, a, as a believer. You see, too many believers see their journey in discipleship as an honest effort to grow and to discipline themselves and to put a turbo on their religious efforts. But praise God, there's another way. Christ came to show us that way. Now, as we, as we look deeper into this, I want you to, to read with me in Acts chapter 2, verse 36, where we Peter actually addresses the crowd that crucified Christ. Because in their mind, there was no glory on Christ. They saw him just as a religious rabbi that had no weight in his being. And then he addresses them and he says to them in verse 36, Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, who you thought was a mere man, whom you crucified both Lord and Messiah. He says, guys, you need to wake up to the weight of the glory of God in this man's life. He is Lord. And immediately when he says that, it's a term that resonated with the Romans who developed the method of crucifixion. Because it was a legal term where somebody would own everything that there is to own. And then the word Messiah is a Hebrew term. That's the one to whom the Jews were yearning for to come and deliver them of their plight. And in one sentence, Peter restores the weight of the glory that's on Christ's life. And it hit the audience. And they responded with this question. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other disciples, apostles, brothers, what shall we do? What shall we do? We, we crucified Christ. We, we dehumanized him. We humiliated him. We, we didn't recognize the glory of God on his life. What shall we do? Is it too late? And then, then Peter replies with this beautiful scripture. He says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And in one sentence... He invites them into a life where they 
can access again the likeness and the glory that God has bestowed and originally designed for mankind because we can access it again in Christ. Now you've got to know for me as a young Christian boy, I thought repentance was always a more honest effort to obey the law. Legalism. But I want to take you into the scripture and show you that repentance isn't a more honest legalistic effort. Repentance is a term that we find through scripture. The Greek word is the word metanoisate, which means to change your mind, your purpose and your intention. To change the whole way in which you perceive life and perceive an object to change the mind about something now when peter addresses the crowd in the book of acts he doesn't ask them to repent about the fact that they broke the law necessarily he asked them to repent about the way they perceived christ because the way that you perceive christ determines the way that you would follow Christ. And then in 2 Corinthians 3, Paul has this brilliant scripture. And we're going to dive into the scripture a bit. And this is where you can start to make serious notes. And uh, it's chapter 3, verse 16 to 18 in the New International Version. First phrase there says, But whenever anyone turns to the Lord, You see that focus moves to the Lord. You sway your mind and your thinking towards Christ. Whoever turns to the Lord, we all who turn to the Lord, contemplate the Lord's glory. As we contemplate His glory, something happens we are being transformed into His image. That's Genesis 1, 26, recreated. But listen, there's so much more. It's not just the glory that Adam had. It is an ever-increasing glory which comes from the Lord. He says it's as if you stare into a mirror and the very same image that you see in the mirror becomes who you are. You you see Christ in a mirror and that mirror reflects His being on you. And suddenly you radiate again His glory. And that's what it means to be a Christ follower. You realize as you contemplate the Lord, You are changed. And therefore, becoming a Christ follower is turning the way you perceive Christ. And therefore, I repent every day of my life. Say, Lord, I need to see more of you. I want to contemplate you. Now, you might sit here and say, I thought Jesus was just a man. I mean... The whole religious thing about Jesus just bored me to death. And I've got a challenge for you. I want to challenge you with what my youth leader challenged me with when I was a young Christian. Challenged me to take the book of Mark and read two chapters of the book of Mark every day for 32 days. And as I read that book, I started to contemplate what I read about Christ and something in me changed. And I realized Christ is not just the example for me. He's the example of me. And I can be in Christ. He calls me at the end of the book to be part of what He is. And um, that's what repentance means. Being a Christ follower means turning your mind towards Christ, contemplating Him. Because here's the law, the spiritual law. Where the mind goes, 
the man follows. And if you want to follow Christ, you need to be mindful of Christ. Mind Christ and follow Christ. I'd like to pray for you. Lord, thank you that following Christ isn't a legalistic or a hedonistic or a ritualistic journey. It is being mindful of you and allowing your glory to be restored in our lives. May our minds contemplate your glory and may your glory be our glory as you replicate yourself in our lives. Amen. Hey, thanks, Brown, for that incredible message. Wasn't that great? Yeah, fantastic. Well, we've got more for you. We've got one of our amazing young adults, Sarah, who has been willing to share her journey and, and a bit of what repentance has meant for her. Mm. And, and after that, we've got an incredible worship song, a modern hymn. And I really encourage you to listen to share Sarah's story and, and to engage in the worship and, and let God speak to you through that. And we'll, we'll see you after that. So enjoy. Hi, I'm Sarah, and I was raised in a Christian home. We moved to Fiji when I was about 10 years old, and we had two years of mission work combined with school and work. Um, I experienced a lot of miracles over there, which defined my faith as a child. And Jesus was a really big part of my identity as a kid until I transitioned in my teen years and found myself experiencing feelings of rejection, hurt, abuse, depression, and anxiety. It was like a tumble effect when I realized that I didn't have a faith of my own. I was, and still am, quite a deep thinker. And I found myself experiencing panic attacks as the mere fact of just not knowing grappled me. I was searching for answers to things that I'd always believed in, but never really understood. I was trying to make sense of the mystery. Instead, found myself tripping over new questions, sometimes the same questions over and over again. See, the problem I faced came with this desire to know the answer because promises weren't enough for me. The moment I started looking for more than God's promises, I found myself losing faith in who he is. I lost the foundation of trusting what God has said in his word. And in that, I lost my faith altogether. I started turning to science, to society, to pleasure, and I cared about what other people thought. I wanted to know all the answers and I wanted to have fun while doing so. I didn't understand God, so I didn't really want anything to do with him. But what I found was that the deeper I searched for answers, the deeper I was swallowed in confusion. I battled confusion for so many years. I was confused mentally, emotionally, sexually, and relationally. I was lost in a sea of confusion that disguised itself as self-actualization. After riding a roller coaster of ups and downs, from science to God, from purity to pleasure, from knowing to not knowing, I realized the cycle that I was in had me more lost and unhappy than I'd ever been before. My three year journey back to God has been like a train wreck. I knew what I needed to do and I knew what I wanted, but I couldn't let go of the desire to know the answers. Instead of humbling myself, I was still trying to demand answers from God. Not only that, but I was starting to become legalistic about the things that I thought I knew. And my selfish quest for truth actually blinded me and robbed me of the ability to love out of the love that God's given me. The problem I had was that I came back to God with expectations expectations of what a relationship with him would look like and expectations of what I would get out of it. He kept trying to draw me in, but each step closer, I would run away in fear that he wasn't who he says he is. 
because I still hadn't accepted his promises. I still didn't think they were enough for me. Then I realised what the real problem was. See, my search for answers had led me to define God in ways that he hadn't defined himself. And when things happened that contradicted the truth I'd made for myself, it led to me blaming God when really it stemmed from the pride that was in my own heart. Because without really knowing it, by blaming God for not being who I thought he was, rather than what, who he says he is, I was actually claiming that I, was, I, I would be a better God. This was my biggest sin. All the external sins that I'd made over the years stemmed from this inner sin called pride. It wouldn't have mattered what actions I did or what anyone else could have done. Wouldn't have mattered if it was lying, stealing, murdering, adultery, adultery. It's not about what I've done, but who I've been. The fact is still the same, I was a sinner. My sin was not determined by my actions, but rather by the condition of my heart out of which the sinful actions followed. You see, pride was believing that I should be the one in control and that I should be the one that knows all the answers. When I truly came to terms with this, with the fact that I'm a sinner to my core, when I understood the gravity of my sin, that's when I truly understood the gravity of what Christ has done for me. When I took hold of repentance with that revelation, I had to let go of my need to know. That being said, repentance was not an easy decision for me. All this time I was waiting until I felt like repenting. I was waiting for all the feelings. I thought it would be an easy decision that God would just change me and heal me immediately. But it didn't happen like that for me. At the start of this year, I was at a fork in the road. I could rebel again and go down the dark path that I'd already traveled, or I could repent, change my ways and choose righteousness and faith. It was a really hard decision for me to make and I didn't really feel like it, but I chose to make a decision that obeyed God regardless of my feelings. Since doing that, I've found the peace that transcends all understanding. I have to choose daily to put my faith into action, to read the Bible, to think of things that are outlined in Philippians 4, 8 and be renewed in my mind. It's not always easy, but repenting isn't just saying sorry and then not changing. No, it's realizing the gravity of your position as a sinner and turning away from that and towards obedience of God. Humility has been the anchor for my repentance. Humbling myself to God and submitting to him led me to trusting his answers and his word. One recent revelation that I've had in response to my repentance is that I've had to learn that sometimes there are questions that I won't get the answers to and I have to be okay with that. There are some answers that I have been wrong about and I could be wrong about and there are some answers that I have to accept even if I don't like them. And that revelation has come from trusting God to be God. I will continue to seek truth by reading his word, but now I know how important it is to be grounded on the foundation of love. The commandment to love God and love others comes first. And with that, pride has no place in my heart anymore. Thanks for listening. strength my soul 
this cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What hearts of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still, when striving cease, my comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless pain, this gift of love and righteousness. He came to save till on the cross as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied for every sin on him was laid. Here in the death of Christ, I live. Welcome back. I uh, truly hope you've been blessed by Brahm's message, Sarah's testimony, and, and the worship we've just enjoyed. Thank you for doing that for us, guys. If, if you want to respond, if you want to reach out, if there's any way we can, we can help you, there's, there's plenty of ways we've talked about earlier. You can rewind and pause that, or there's information coming up that you can contact us through. And, and we really want our journey with you. If, if there's any way we can support you, let us know. So mm. trust that you've been blessed. By this, thanks for helping out today, Alex. You've been a great sport. <laughs> oh, anytime. <laughs> and we love you all, we miss you, and we'll see you again yeah. soon. So tune in next week. Thanks.